Welcome to the Seniors Forum. My name is Nick Tommaso. In 1986, my guest was the first member of Congress to bring the issue of the Albanian people's rights in the Balkans to the attention of the United States government. He is also responsible for the first congressional hearing on Kosovo in 1987. He has made more than 30 trips to the Balkans since leaving Congress in 1989. He is the founding president of the Albanian American Civic League, the only registered grassroots lobby representing the concerns and interests of the Albanian people. In 2005, it marked its 50, 50, 15th year of continuous service in Washington and around the world for the Albanian national cause of seven million Albanians living side by side in the Balkans, in Albania, Kosovo, Macedonia, Montenegro, the Preshi Valley, and Shamiria. Before going to Congress, he was practicing CPA. He was the first practicing certified public accountant ever elected to the United States House of Representatives. He was raised in the Bronx, he graduated from Fordham Prep in 1958 and Fordham University in 1962, and I might add, with honors. Please join me in welcoming the Honorable Joe Diaguardi to the Seniors Forum. Nick, thank you, and thank you for Welcome. inviting me. It's my pleasure, Joe. Be before we get on to anything, you have to explain to me, how does being an Albanian come up with an Italian name. You now, know, I've, do, I've done some research right. on it, and I was amazed. I was born in Italy, but I was six years old when I came here. But I was amazed when, when I read that there are, I think, 52 towns and villages yes. in Italy that are predominantly Albanians. There's over 50, and I was honored to bring National Geographic magazine there in 1999, believe it or not, the Kosovo War was just beginning. And I get a call because they saw my website, the Albanian American Civic League, and nobody else in those days, even in 1999, forget about 1986, we know in 1986 it was completely off the radar screen. But even in 1999, there were very few experts that could talk about the history of Albanians anywhere. Uh, and I learned all this in Congress and after, and I'll tell you how I got there. But here they called me, they said, you know, the Kosovo war is on, refugees are coming now from Kosovo and Albania into Italy. Uh, you know, could you maybe uh, give us some background on this refugee problem? And we have a senior editor going over there, Preet Veselin, and uh, he wants to go to the Straits of Otranto because it's only 45 miles from Albania to Italy. Now think about it, that's closer than Key West is to Cuba or Haiti. I know, I lived right across from there, in Barry. Uh, oh, so I you, the east side, of, well, my mother oh. was born in Giovinazzo. Oh. She's Bares, okay? <laughs> now, my father was born on the other side of Italy. We're Byzantine. Yeah, I think we are. We'll get the DNA straightened out. But on the other side of Italy, there's a little Albanian-speaking village in Avellino, near Naples, Avellino. called, yes. called Greci, G-R-C-I. Uh, actually, the next Italian town to it that's large uh, is Ariano Irpina, right in the Avellino. So Greci is one of these 51 or 52 villages that speak Albanian today in Italy. Really? Now, how did they get there? 600 years ago, the Ottoman Turks Ottoman, right. were looking to take over all of Europe. And it was this great Albanian general. See, in those days, the Albanians had the army of Europe. In fact, Italians don't know, my friends, that this great general was invited in 1443 to come into the kingdom of Naples. Don't forget, Italy he's wasn't- got, He's got a long name, isn't he? Isn't uh, George, <laughs> it's, it's George Castriati. Oh, Castriati. The nickname is Skanderbeg. Sken, yes, Skanderbeg. Skanderbeg. And where did that nickname Skanderbeg. come from? The Turks gave it to him. Iskander, Iskander, that means Alexander. Bey means Lord. So colloquialize it's Skanderbeg, but it's really Iskander Bey. Now, why did they call him Lord Alexander? He was so good, they couldn't beat him for 27 years. He held the Turks back from the rest of Europe. They called him after Alexander the Great, who was another Albanian many years ago. Everybody thinks he's Macedonian. 
but he had an Albanian mother. This is Alexander uh -huh. the Great. But I don't want to tell too yeah, much history. Yeah. <laughs> you go back to history, you can get lost. Yeah, it's quite long But history. the beauty of my discovering my roots as an Italian is that it combines with Albanian history. How? Well, obviously, my parents were born in Italy. That means I'm Italian-American. Right. I was raised in an Italian-American neighborhood but you in the Bronx. Born, you were born where? Here. You were, oh, you in were the Bronx, 1940. My dad came here in 1929, 29. speaking only two languages, Albanian and Italian. Now, you might say, how did he speak Albanian? Well, when you're in these mountaintop villages right. and you're isolated from the rest of the people, you don't lose your language. Right. And they didn't intermarry. In fact, my father married my mother, who's Italian, because they met when they were here. Uh, Her family came here, I think it was in 1913, and then his family came here in 1929, but here's where they met. The point was that when I got to Congress, I didn't know all this. I thought when I heard my father speaking this strange Albanian language to his family, he was speaking one of these fancy dialects of Italian. Don't forget, if you hear the Barres speak, right, right, di Rava, right, you, you would <laughs> think uh, you know, you're in the South someplace. You know, sometimes you don't right. understand how the Southerners right. speak English. So I never gave it much of a thought except my Albanian grandmother, who we lived with until I was six years old. So I do speak some of the language. Right? You know, we used to go to Pelham Bay yeah. together on Sundays and whatnot from the Bronx. We moved to Westchester in 57, so I was about 16 when we moved to Westchester. But my Albanian grandmother used to talk about the Turks and this and that, and I was always curious. I said, Grandma, get me one of these books so I can understand where the Turks have something to do with my Italian history. Were you ever in Manhattan? Did you ever live in Manhattan? No, really? no, no, oh, but my mother, mother's family moved to the east side of 100th Street, and as oh, a young girl, right. she That's went to PS 100, I think, right there on 99th Street. Yeah, because yeah. we lived on 86th Street. Right. Well, there was At a big first, Italian we lived on 93rd Street and 3rd Avenue. There was a big there. Italian, big uh, Italian uh, area there, but I was born in the Bronx near Arthur Avenue. I went to St. Martin of Tours School. Oh, I used okay. to walk across Belmont Avenue to get to Fordham Prep. So you might say I was born in the Italian, yeah. that little Italy part, yeah. right, right there. But it wasn't until I got to Congress in 1985 that one of my key supporters, my finance chairman, was an Irish-American. Bill Casson, he threw my first fundraiser for me on my birthday at the Minersing Island Club in Rye, where he belonged. Mm -hmm. So here's my birthday, September 20th, 1985. I'm now, you know, 45 years old. And he brings in his workers. He was a lawyer, but he had a construction firm. And his workers happened to be Albanians from Kosovo. Oh. Now, I never knew them. So here they come in, and my father was alive then. He died two years later. And we're all proud, I'm now a congressman. You know, when you come from an immigrant family, you move from the Bronx sure. to Westchester, sure. and then you become the congressman right. representing just this great the, just county. Just have, have a college education, is there? Yeah, well, <laughs> but certainly my whole family was beaming, and any time I had an event, they wanted to be there. So my father invited his sisters and whatnot, and here I am with all my friends. And this group of Albanians was standing next to my father, and he's speaking in the Arbresh dialect, which is the Albanian yeah. from Italy, which you can understand if you're from Yugoslavia. It's, it's the same roots. Yeah. And they come running up to me. They overhear him speaking Albanian. They said, we thought you were Italian-American. How come your father's speaking Albanian? I said, well, I am Italian-American. My parents were born in Italy. But I know that my father has this kind of uh, sub-background, had something to do with the Turks. And, and I think maybe it has something to do with Albanians Albanese, Gegida, going back to the Romans. No, no, you are from Kosovo. Don't you realize our people got to Italy in, the, in, in 1488 when the Turks were overrunning our country That's after right. 20? No, no one ever taught me this. They came to my house in Norishel every week with books, yeah. with memos. They came to my office lobbying me. And by the way, you mentioned the lobby I started. Yeah. I'm a volunteer lobbyist. I don't get paid. I'm doing this as kind of a gift to my father's people who were oh, so true. isolated yeah. on the other side. Because my father's people 600 years ago had to flee the barbaric treatment. They were all Catholics in those days. Today, you see a lot of Albanians are Muslim. Well, they were converted because the t Turks were all Muslim and Muslim. they occupied right. the Albanian peninsula there on the other side of the Adriatic for 450 years. And many of those people couldn't get jobs if they didn't convert to Islam. So that's the, you know, the, the problem. 
that, that, we, uh, that, that Albanians have had, you know? So in any case, I, it's a great story, and I became their spokesman in Congress. And little did I know how few people knew about this place, Kosovo. In fact, there was only one person in Congress, not even Bob I, Dole. I don't, I don't think any American heard of it until uh, the, right. when well, they had it was Tom Lantos, who was chairman of the Congressional Human Rights Caucus, and just passed away. He was chairman of the International Relations mm -hmm. Committee. Right. He, right. Tom Lantos, mm -hmm. was born in Hungary. He's a Hungarian Jew who escaped the Holocaust. So when I went to him, because I was working with him on apartheid, uh, on, on the issue of Soviet Jewry, on the issue of Tibet's, and so I figured, let me go to him and mention the story sure, I'm something, getting, something human rights common. that Serbs are killing these Albanians. And he said, Joe, I know the Albanian people. I'm born in Hungary. I even know their hero, Skanderbeg, because he was a contemporary of our great freedom fighter, Janusz Honyadi. Boy, did I hit the jackpot. So here this guy, Lantos, very prominent, and through him I got the Jewish lobby to understand oh. that this was a key issue. And, you know, I didn't have much power in those days. I was a junior member of the minority party. But once we got the Jewish lobby to understand that Albanians saved all the Jews who got there during the Holocaust, then we got their support, and the rest is history, Nick. Uh, my wife, by the way, is a former publisher. My first wife passed away. I met Shirley in the 90s. We got married in the late 90s at Fordham University, believe it or not. But uh, my wife and I... Now, your wife, from what I want to understand, she has a... She plays a big part in your... Oh, yes, your she does, because she was a publisher of a company on international politics. That's how we met. And uh, the interesting thing is you could say that she and I, it took 20 years after I left Congress, created a new state called Kosovo, because Kosovo now was recognized first by the United States on February 17, uh, 1987, and now 62 countries have recognized it. But it's still not quite there because the Serbs are fighting right. in Europe to keep it from mm -hmm. being recognized further. But 22 of the 27 European Union nations have also recognized it. And I didn't know we were going to discuss this. I thought we were going to discuss uh, unaccountable no, no. Congress no, well, well, as a CPA, we'll, we'll but get, it's an we'll interesting get, we'll, story. But it's, it's, it is interesting. That's why yeah. I want, I'm, I'm a very attentive in listening to what But I am Italian-American, but if you ask the Albanians, they all think I'm Albanian <laughs> because my family spoke Albanian as well as Italian. Oh, that's great. That's great, Joe. You, you have a, certainly have a, a very interesting and... Uh, and the job's not finished. There's a lot of other problems going on in the Balkans that we're working on, and you'll see them unfold in the next year. Uh, uh, now, when, you, when your father immigrated to the United States, that was in, back in 1929. 29, yeah. Now, he was 15 years old. He was old. 15. But, uh, what, no kind of labor, what kind of labor was, uh, labor was okay. he? What did he? Well, don't forget, most Italians in the southern part of Italy who came here were poor. Okay. Looking for oh, jobs. Well, right. The aristocrats stayed there. The poor people came we here. We came in 1935. Well, I was born in 1920. And I'm sure that you needed a job or your family yeah, was yeah. looking for work. Well, that's really what was happening in my father's town. It got so bad during the Depression that people were literally starving. My father tells me that uh, he remembers two of his cousins in the town being given to a local convent because they couldn't Good, feed. Couldn't. They had large families. Right. They were farmers. And one of the families had 10 kids. Two of them, uh, young ladies, became nuns. In fact, I remember one who used to visit her over here until she passed away. But the object, I guess dad only had a fourth grade education in, in Italy, and they were farmers, uh, and they used to come down once a week. My dad used to say how he put the wine, the nuts, and all their stuff on the donkeys, and they'd sell to the Italians in uh, Ariano, in, in Avellino, Avellino, and then they'd go back. Uh, so there was really no integration back in those days. Today, there's a lot more integration. It's not as isolated as it was. So you, you find Albanians marrying Italians, and my father had to come here to meet my mother. She's totally Italian. But he came here with really no skills except farming. But in a way, that helped him. Guess how, Nick? He mo he's in Harlem. He immediately started shining shoes at 15 to make some money. But then he saw that the African-American people in Harlem liked greens. Now, being a farmer, he was comfortable with that. But he was very clever. He found out that they bought the greens, the, the stores in that area, from the Bronx Terminal, Terminal Market Bronx by Yankee Bronx Stadium. Bronx, right. So a year later, he went there himself. I don't know how he got the, the car or whatever he did. 
He brought the boxes and started a, a stand right on the corner of 145th Street and St. Nicholas Avenue. Huh. And by 1933, three years later, he had a store. So already he had a store in 1933. What is he now? He's, uh, he was born in 19, 20 years old. He meets my mother the next year. She's now living on Belmont Avenue in the Bronx. But in those days, you'd like to go to the movie theaters right. up on the Grand Concourse, right. the Paradise, the Paradise, or the Lois Fairmont, right? right? But by 19, my mother tells me she met him because he was driving this fancy car around and they met, you know, as kids normally meet, you know, talking on a street corner or something. And my dad invited her to a, a movie. He got to, to like her. Her name was Grace Graziella in Italian. Her last name was Paparella. Grace Paparella. Paparella. That's her maiden name. Uh, I remember that name because I use it on my credit cards as my, my, my key word. Well, they have I'm to always check. That you did it because <laughs> all the barets, you from Barry, all yeah. the barets. I know uh, as far as uh, our people, where we come from, we come from a small town in Barry called San Icandro. There's many of those small uh, villages there. Right. Yeah. And uh, we're all, all uh, icemen. Yes. We're all in the ice well, like the Cirillo family. Right. They started exactly. in ice, they got into oil. Right. They got into oil. When they right. came, coal, coal first, right. then, then oil. Right. It's amazing. Yeah. Well, then my dad had this fancy car. Can you imagine here he is selling vegetables, doing so well. He had this Willie's Night with a silver wheel. And my mother says in 1934, he was the only one in the Bronx with a radio in the car. No kidding. Here he is, 21. <laughs> so you could see he was clever already. And by the time I was born in 1940, he had this store in the Bronx on Tremont Avenue. And that's where I was raised yeah. until we moved to Westchester. Yeah, and that's the same thing. We went from ice, and my father bought a little fruit and vegetable store, and from there we turned into a deli and we went right. to a supermarket. It's, it's the way Italians yeah. progressed in America. Right. They worked right. hard. The, you know, the roads were oh. not paved with gold here. Someone said right. the Italians well, paved those roads. We were told. <laughs> I know, I know, I know, coming from generations back, they were told that, right. you know, go to America because the streets are paved with gold. Right. But, uh, you know, no one told that you had to work for that goal. That's true. You know, it was there, but you had to work for it. Well, now, ask me some accounting questions, since I'm yeah. the only okay. <laughs> practicing certified public accountant ever right. elected to Congress. Nah. And I wrote this book about it, Unaccountable Congress. It yeah. doesn't add up, because I wanted the well, people to I know got, I got my this. experience. Yeah, yeah. And since, if you want to talk about that, let's, yeah. talk, let's talk about this, because I picked up the, the New York Times, and this article on expanding health coverage and shoring up Medicare. Right. What, what, is, what is double counting? Explain to the people what double counting is. Well, you know, I mean, I'm going to offer this book to anyone who's listening to this show. Uh, all they have to do is send me a priority stamp. I think it's like 450. All right, why don't you give me yeah. the people it's, your... It's, uh, just send it to my name, Dio Guardi, P.O. Box 70, Ossining, New York, 10562. So that's P.O. Box 70, Ossining, New York, 10562, or just call the directory. My name is listed in, in Austin, uh, Dio Guardi, D-I-O-G-U-A-R-D-I. And now people will remember the name because my daughter, Cara, is the fourth <laughs> judge on American Idol, and she's using the name Dio Guardi. Even though she, she just is, got married this year, she's not changing her name. So <laughs> that's good. And by the way, for those who don't know what it means, it's a beautiful Italian name that goes back maybe to Roman times because Dio, Dio means God. God like Deus in Latin, and Guardi means watch or protect. Watch. So I told people, if you pronounce my name right, Dio Guardi, you're mm. saying a prayer and you don't even know it. <laughs> well, and the, and the title of the book is appropriate. It's Unaccountable it's Congress. Unaccountable Congress. And let me Correct. say about that, Nick, because you'll see me in the back here and you'll see what the Secretary of Treasury said about this book in those days. This book was written in 1992, 17 years ago and it couldn't be more true today. I was worried about the deficits back then. Believe me, no one could have foreseen that we'd have a deficit last year of a trillion, 500 billion. That's not the national debt. That was the, like the national debt when I was a congressman. Now the annual deficit is a trillion, 500 billion. And, but the point is, I took a congressman's voting card, a plastic card, just like your credit card, and I put it in the front of the book here to make the point why Congress is unaccountable. Here it is, the credit card, congressional credit card. Credit line unlimited, expiration date never, bill to future generations. Now this article on double counting, it's covered in this book. Nick, I was the first one to forecast the potential bankruptcy of the United States of America. It's chapter four. The title is The Big Apple, that's New York City, and Washington, one bailout after another. I had worked on 
the problem of, of New York City in 1975 when my firm, Arthur Anderson, was hired for the bailout. So I saw the problems that you can get into, but and I said, we're going to get into the same you, problems here. Be that you were in Congress, wh how, how, what is the thinking of these people that, get, that, that are in, they're in office? Unfortunately, okay. it's getting reelected that counts more. And since every two years, the entire House of Representatives, 435 people, has to get elected. And today, we're so partisan. Their main concern is, how do I raise enough money if I'm not a multimillionaire? Because if you are, you can use your own money. We know that. We saw that at Corzine. We see that with Bloomberg. But if you are not, and many congressmen come from teaching positions and other things, so they're concerned about survival, and they're not spending enough time thinking about the big issues. And by the way, most of them are attorneys. Of 400 and 435 back in, when I left in 1989, 286 were attorneys. attorneys. No CPAs. Now you have a few more. But most of what they do is numbers, the budget process, the appropriations. You need someone who can count, and they don't have a good accounting system. They don't have the one that the Securities and Exchange Commission imposes on the corporations before you can buy their stock to protect the shareholders. Because right. Congress exempted themselves from the SEC rules. So and, right off the bat, people must, should be mad about that. You must believe in uh, time limits. You well, that's, time limit? well, I do. I think it's important. If the process is not working to be competitive, and if they did something I don't care for, design districts by computers, so I give you more Republican votes if you're a Republican, you give me more Democrat if I'm a Democrat, and therefore there's no competition, no comp because now out of 435 seats, they say only 30 are competitive. So where's the new ideas? Where's the new leadership? Where's the competition? And we did the same in New York State. Why do you think you've got these guys being indicted, like Senator Bruno and Seminario? Because they went to business on the public's uh, resources. They used their office up there to make money they shouldn't have made, and they didn't disclose it. If they disclosed it, we would have known. At least in Congress, we have disclosure. Uh, what, and uh, what, what is this paradox that has some lawmakers in a quandary over this uh, issue of double a Double accounting. accounting. Well, the point made in that article is the Obama administration is claiming that this uh, health care bill, the one that was passed in the Senate, now they got to combine it with the one in the House. Right. We still don't know what's going to come out. But the one in the Senate would be a deficit-reducing thing. In other words, they're saying that over 10 years, this will reduce the deficit by, I think, $130 billion. Well, you know, some of these congressmen are pretty smart. They're businessmen, and they started to figure out well, wait a minute. You're saying that part of the savings is going to be from Medicare, and the rest of it's going to be for other things. But they said, well, don't we have a Medicare trust fund? Aren't you telling us that the savings that you're talking about are going to make the Medicare trust fund stay longer? You should not count that as part of deficit reduction, because that accounting is in the Medicare trust fund. But you're saying, you're combining that savings, several hundred billion, with the other savings, and we're only going to be short 132 billion. No. You see, we have a phony system, and it started with Lyndon Baines Johnson. Are you ready for this, Nick? To disguise the cost of the Vietnam War in 1967-68, he came up with something called a unified budget. Now, what does that mean? And we still use it today. He saw there were surpluses in the trust fund for Social Security. We didn't have Medicare then, it was just starting, right. right? And he saw all this cash sitting there, and he said, why should I report this big deficit from the war when we have that cash? Why don't I just consolidate the surplus from Social Security the with the deficits and everything else and come up with a net number? This way, the people will not be so uh, angry that we're spending too much money. Would you believe we've been doing that since 1968? meaning that the people don't know the real deficit. And as a result of that, when Clinton got in, because he had some reforms on welfare and whatnot, and, and some of that came over from the, the Bush and Reagan administration, but he was at the time when he said we had surpluses. And people were saying, ah, oh, we don't need DeGuardi's book anymore. Now there's no more deficits. We got surpluses. I said, baloney, those surpluses are because of the phony accounting system they're using. They're using the Social Security surpluses 
to say they have surpluses, but that money has got to stay in the Social Security Trust they, Fund. They do down even locally. Right. So you, you're not supposed they, to take that money and just combine it with everything else. So my book today is even more powerful because people see that we took $5 trillion out of the Social Security Trust Fund with this unified budget to reduce the deficits over the years. So not only do we have to pay these people that are coming into the retirement, the baby boomers, we got to find $5 trillion that we spent on other things. On other things. Now, this is not the way to run right. a business, and you wouldn't run your checkbook that way, but we're running the country Joe, that way. Joe, we're, we're, we're running out of time here already, and I know you have a lot to say. But we I, have to do I another want, show, I, Nick. I want, yeah, we'll, oh, we'll do it. No, that's definite. That's a definite. But I want you to look in the camera now. Yeah. Tell the people, what, do you, what would you like people to do in order for, I know you're involved with the- uh, Rethinking with Westchester the, the County rethinking Government. Westchester County Government. Right. Well, give, maybe give them a few pointers of what you believe should be. Okay, well, on the national scale, I think we have to start thinking differently. I'm a Republican, my wife's a Democrat, but your party should be America. Think independent. Look at people for their qualifications and how they stand on issues. Don't just have a knee-jerk reaction, oh, that's my party, I'm gonna vote for them. That doesn't go anymore, and it shouldn't go anymore. We need to think differently. On the issue at Westchester County, out of 3,000 counties in America, we are the highest taxed. Imagine, of all America, our county is the most expensive. Now, I got involved with a Democrat. I don't believe in doing anything without someone on the other side of the aisle. I did it in Congress with Mr. Lantos, with Mr. Barney Frank, uh, with Chairman Conyers, uh, with Jerry Nadler, because I feel if you're gonna do something important, you need to do it with a smart, intelligent, honest person on the other side of the aisle. So here, Paul Feiner, the uh, Greenberg supervisor, and I are now doing this rethinking, and we're gonna come to you shortly with a petition to sign, because if the Board of Legislators of Westchester County does not come up with the right Westchester County Charter Revision Commission to restructure this county so that we become efficient and downsize it and streamline it, then your signature is going to then eliminate that board because we found a law called the Alternative Form of County Government Law put on the books in 1952. Now we got to get like 30,000 signatures to make it work. So if, some, if someone wants to get in touch with you or wants to Right. Join up with now, this. Now, uh, one thing I'd like you to do is to uh, please, if you want to be one of the ones that carry this petition, uh, call me on my cell phone, 914-671-8583. Truth in Government is the nonprofit that I have that's raising the money now to make this thing work. But again, it's 914-671-8583. And if you forgot that number or you can't write it down, just look at the phone book for Joe Diaguardi, Call me an ossening. I'd love to have people around this county carry this petition. It has to be witnessed and all to get these signatures. Uh, again, I want to mention out there that get in touch with Joe. You heard what he has to say, and he has a lot more to say. We'll have him again, and you, you'll, you'll continue on where we left off. Absolutely. There. And, uh, but please, if you have any questions, if you want to get in touch with me, you know, you know the, uh, the method we use. Uh, Get in touch with me, call me. My number is 245-7176, or you can reach me at the, at the Senior Center here in, York, in Yorktown. So with any question you may have, any problems you may have, please. And put them by me first, and I'm, I'm sure I can help and you. And if you want a copy of the book, just send me a priority stamp, PO Box 70, Ossining, New York, and uh, I will put this in with articles that I've written since showing you that it's gotten worse, not better, in the last 17 years. And thank you again for watching, and we'll see you next time.